The landscape of this region seems unchanged from how it probably looked thousands of years ago. In fact, it's a landscape that's baked into the stories of the Bible, and so many of them involve stones. There are rocks all over the place. One of the most famous stories is about a stone and a slingshot, how the boy David faced off against the great hulking giant Goliath, the same David who the Bible says grew up to be the king who built this city of Jerusalem. David is one of the most fascinating characters in world literature. He looks almost perfect. David is the Bible's first real hero. David was a very talented man who could sing, who could fight, who could lead. He's a poet, he's a musician. We're told that he's absolutely gorgeous to look at, and God loves him. And he's been portrayed by some of Hollywood's biggest stars in movies such as David and Bathsheba and King David. Respect what is ours, and we shall keep faith with you. David was ancient Israel's greatest king. He is also one of Islam's earliest prophets, and Christians believe Jesus is directly descended from David. And yet, this hero was a deeply flawed man. David was kind of a bastard. There are some texts in which we can see so clearly that David is a problematic character. He's running a protection racket. He's got bodies piling up all over the place. He's strategically marrying women in different parts of the land of Israel to consolidate his run for the throne. But that wasn't how it all started. The first time we meet David in the Bible, he's an innocent young shepherd boy with that stone in his hand. He was the only one from his tribe brave enough to face Goliath, the most fearsome fighter from a rival tribe, the Philistines, whom the Bible describes as over 10 feet tall. We don't have any proof that David actually ever fought Goliath, and yet, it does, to a certain extent, make sense. We know that the Philistines are there. We know that the Israelites are there. We know that they're banging heads against each other. And it is written that David felled the giant with only a slingshot. And we all think of it as the teeny little pea that brought down a giant. Well, the slingshot at that time was, in fact, rather like the sort of sniper rifle of today. I mean, these could be huge stones. They could be propelled at incredible velocity, and they could go straight through armor, like a handheld bazooka that can actually stop a tank. And today, from Tiananmen Square to Tahrir Square, the story is invoked when the most unlikely heroes stand up to forces that seem certain to crush them. Prophet David does win against Goliath. It's not only about him, but the underprivileged, the underdog, the weak, is rendered victorious ultimately. According to the Bible, David's triumphs continued. He recaptured the Ark of the Covenant from the Philistines. It had held the Ten Commandments. And he brought together the warring tribes of the 12 sons of Jacob to form a nation. Even today, the flag of modern Israel, founded 3,000 years after his reign, bears the symbol known as the Star of David. And Jerusalem is the place he chose as his capital, making it not only a holy city, but a political one too. There's evidence that King David really lived. Just 20 years ago in northern Israel, archaeologists discovered a kind of ancient royal archive called a stela. And it mentions a house or dynasty of David, and the reading is clear. It also mentions an entity, a state-like entity, called Israel. It may seem like a small thing, but it's an important discovery. It makes David the earliest biblical figure whom we can confirm actually existed. But the stealer doesn't confirm some of the more scandalous details of David's life. David, he was a guy who was the king. Oh, he had it all. He could have anything he wanted. He had the absolute loyalty of his soldiers. He was on top. And then he goes out, breaks a moral covenant with God. David was, was on his roof in Jerusalem, and he saw this beautiful woman bathing on the roof. And he said, who's that woman? They said, that's Bathsheba, wife of Uriah the Hittite. His eye is the beginning of the problem. His eye that 
makes him forget everything he's heard in terms of God's commandments. He says, she's hot and I, I, I want that, bring, bring me that. And his henchmen go, bring him Bathsheba. And so that I leads him to the act of adultery. And when the woman says, I am pregnant, he goes deeper and deeper into the darkness. And here's where the Bible becomes a little like Pulp Fiction. King David tried to cover his tracks by getting Bathsheba's husband Uriah drunk. In the hopes that Uriah will immediately bed his wife and be none the wiser. All does not go according to plan. David has Uriah killed and then brings Bathsheba to live with him. The intimate details of David's personal life are unlike anything else found in the Bible. And that suggests that some of the text is extremely ancient and may be based on an actual memoir of his court because the portrayal of, um, of David is so real. It's a familiar story, the sometimes reckless sense of entitlement that comes with power. It's known today as the Bathsheba Syndrome. A lot of people think of that as a story about sexual lust, and it kind of is, but it's a story about power and how power corrupts. And wow, that's all over our world today. But this Bible story is also a cautionary tale. David's sins impact his children and his grandchildren all the way down. David's sons have grown up learning how to deal with women from their father. Two of David's sons grew up to be rapists. And indeed, David did suffer the consequences of his actions. The child he's conceived with Bathsheba dies and he mourns and mourns and mourns and again you get the old attractive lovely David again. We have to look at David in both ways. He rose to the heights of power and he sunk to the depths of depravity and yet he comes back. He repents. And the Bible tells us that God never stops loving David. He forgives the sins of this imperfect hero. David was given a second chance, a second child with Bathsheba, a son named Solomon.